Well, it's good to be with you this morning. It's truly a, a joy to be here and uh, definitely different, different weather from what I left a couple days ago or, or yesterday, actually. Uh, so I think by, by South Florida standards, we're having like an Arctic winter. Of, it's in the 30s and 40s. So I don't know if South, I don't think South Florida feels those temperatures as I can recall. Um, Anyway, so good to be with you guys this morning. I'd love to begin by just sharing a little bit about myself, a little bit about my family. So I've got a few photos that I'm gonna put up on the screen. So there's my, my family, my wife, Katie, and our kids, Caden and Madeline. So Caden's just starting first grade, and then Madeline is in preschool. And uh, so she's a great little sister. She loves helping you know, to pick her brother up from school and, and walking him to, to school and that sort of thing. And uh, got a few pictures of our ministry as well. So you see in this picture here, just the thousands of, of students there. This is at one of the universities where I spent a lot of my time, Temple University, which incidentally began as a Christian university 150 years ago. Now it's just a, a state university like so many. And uh, when I look out on, on that picture there, if you can go, there you go, go back. Um, you know, you'd see a similar site on a lot of other campuses, but you just, you get the sense there are just thousands and thousands of young people, and many of them, they look really cool. You know, they, they got the shades on, they know how to dress to impress, but so many of them are really lost. I, I'm reminded, in fact, of Jesus' words where it says that he looked out on the crowds and he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd that they were lost, that they were confused. And I think that's very, a very apt description of what we see on many of these university campuses. And so what we do is we are there to engage these students with the gospel. We believe that the gospel is still just as true as it was 2,000 years ago, that, that Jesus' resurrection, it's still applicable, it's still relevant today. And Jesus is still in the business of saving sinners and he's still in the business of changing lives. And so we are there to engage this next generation with the good news of Jesus Christ as we do that and, uh, you know, engaging students in relationships and, and inviting them to uh, Bible studies on campus and things like that. We also make it our aim to, as we're establishing students in the faith, helping them grow, we also want to equip them for ministry. I'm a big believer that uh, as you step out into ministry, as you serve, and it could be in a lot of different ways uh, in the church or in the community, but as you step into ministry, it really helps you to own God's mission. It helps you to actually grow. Sometimes we buy into uh, this myth of maturity and we think, well, I've got to wait until I've achieved some kind of a, you know, high level of I've got to be an expert in all things Bible and I've got to go to seminary for all these years before I can really do anything. Well, I don't believe that's true. I believe that every one of us is called to play a part in God's mission. And so as we're equipping students for ministry, got, a, got some of our students there, photo, they're, they're leading small group Bible studies, they're helping with outreaches and things. And, and so God's really doing something exciting there. This morning though, I wanna talk to you about reaching the next generation. As we begin, I'd like to start by reading from the book of Daniel. And so let's look there together in Daniel chapter one, verses one through eight. It says here that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among them, those who were chosen from some, were, were from some of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them some new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. 
But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Let's pause for a moment and pray. Father God, this morning as we gather here, we come with expectant hearts. We come saying, Father, we're asking you to teach us. We're asking you to guide us. Lord, I pray this morning that you would help each person here to leave refreshed, strengthened, and encouraged. God, we're asking that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit this morning as we study your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to begin this morning by looking at a little bit of the context that leads up to what we just read. So to take a few steps back to look at the context, we know that Israel, this nation, this this people, they had God's favor, that God had chosen them to bless them, going back to Abraham, and then uh, through a chain of events, these people had ended up in slavery in Egypt. And God, in his goodness and his faithfulness, he had brought them out of Egypt. And that was a journey, but he was bringing them into this, this fruitful land, this place where he was going to prosper them, where he was going to help them. And we read in the book of Exodus some of what God said to them as they were coming out of that place of slavery. God says to them, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so there was this promise that God had given to them, but it was conditional. God was saying, look, if you keep my commandments, I'm going to do something extraordinary for you. And we read in the history of the Jewish people, the history of Israel, we read how they came out and very quickly they started to turn away from the Lord. But they would have these judges, men like uh, like Samson, uh, who would would bring them back to a place of, of understanding that the Lord is God and that they needed to serve him. But as we continue in looking, looking at what God was doing, we see that their hearts began to more and more long for a human king. And so the first human king that they had, this is, you know, transitioning from a place where they were just kind of serving the Lord and they would have prophets and people kind of guiding them, but really God was, was really leading the nation directly. Uh, and they had this first human king named Saul who he looked great. I mean, he was a handsome guy. He was a tall guy. He was, you know, just an exceptional specimen of a man. And yet what happened? This guy, he turned out not to be a very great leader. He began to trust in himself and began to disobey the Lord. But then the next leader that they had was David. David was described as being a man after God's own heart. Now, now David, if you're familiar at all with his story, I mean, he had some major issues as well. Uh, Even, you know, the most serious, he actually orchestrated uh, another man's murder when he'd committed adultery with this guy's wife. And so this guy, he's far from perfect. He's messed up. He's very human. But yet what's different about David, I think why we read that he was a man after God's own heart, was not that he was a, a perfect person. It was just that he was a man that when he was confronted with his sin, he was a man that would repent. He was a man that would say, you know what, oh, what have I done? And he sought to make amends. He sought to change. And so that's actually, it's a great lesson for us that none of us in here are perfect. I know I'm not perfect, but I hope that we would have a heart, that we would be like David, that when we're confronted with our sin, that we wouldn't harden our heart and we wouldn't resist uh, God's word and the conviction that God would bring to us, but that we would respond knowing that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And so David was a, a great king for the most part. And David helped to bring together resources that ultimately his son Solomon would build a temple for God. But Solomon was really the last, the the last king that Israel would have a a united kingdom. Solomon, he he got entangled with some things and had some some wives that really led him astray in some of his thinking. Um, And so Solomon was the last king that oversaw a united kingdom of of a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. After him, for the next several hundred years, the the line was split. And you had these two different kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and it had a, a capital of Samaria. And then you had a southern kingdom that was called Judah that had its capital of Jerusalem. And so what happened 
is they just continued in both of these kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the people of God were disobedient to the Lord. They were not following the commands that God had given them. And so what happened in the northern kingdom, as the Assyrian empire was expanding, the northern kingdom ultimately was overrun in 722 BC and that capital city of Samaria fell and those people were, were taken into captivity. In the southern kingdom, they lasted a little bit longer. They had, a, had several kings that, that you know, brought about change and, and you know, tried to bring the people back to God, people that, that maybe you've heard of like Hezekiah and later Josiah. But uh, like the northern kingdom before them, ultimately they fell to a foreign power as well. And so they fell to the Babylonian Empire. And that's really where we, we pick up. And what we read there in Daniel chapter 1 is, is Babylon has come in and, and, and their strategy was to overwhelm these nations with force. They, they were just a dominant military power. And so they would come in and they would just dominate these uh, these foreign nations that they were coming into with their superior force. And what they would do is they would remove the people from their land. They would plunder the land. They would take all the wealth out of that land and they would take it to Babylon. And so the, the people of Israel, the people of Judah, their, their places were plundered. All of their resources were taken away. But they didn't stop there. The Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar as their king and, and ruler he took it one step further. He would seek to identify some of the brightest and best young people, and then he would bring them in to this system where they would be trained, where they would be removed from their families. They would not only be removed from their homeland, but removed from their families, removed from all the things that would associate them with their culture, and they were being put into training. They were being trained to either serve in the Babylonian court or maybe to go back and be basically uh, indoctrinated into the Babylonian way and kind of be influencers for Babylon among the Jewish people. And so that's what we are reading about here in Daniel chapter 1. And so what I want to do this morning, having said that, is to make a parallel. I believe there's a significant parallel that we can make this morning between what we read about in Daniel chapter 1 and what was happening with the people of Israel and more specifically the people of Judah uh, here in Babylon and Daniel and his friends. As, as Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians were seeking to indoctrinate them, there's a significant parallel that we can make between that and some significant things that are happening in our own generation. Much like what was happening then, I believe that today there is a strategic group of people in our country. There are these young adults, these young men and women, and many of them are being taken away by the culture. They're being indoctrinated. They're being, they're being uh, forced into ways of thinking and ways of living that ultimately are not representative of God's kingdom and of God's truth, but ultimately are more representative of the culture that we live in. I want to highlight that for just a minute. On our university campuses, I believe that we have a strategic opportunity. If you've never considered this, bear with me for just a moment. We have a group of young men and women that are in training to be really the future leaders of our nation. And in fact, many nations from all around the world send their best and brightest young people to our universities and colleges here in the United States. These people are going to be some significant decision makers in the years to come. But while they're there, there are some extreme pressures that are put upon them, both by their peers as well as ideas that they're being faced with and forced into that perhaps they've never considered before. I know that that was true for me. As Pastor Brian referenced earlier, I spent some significant key years of my life here and, and I sat in, in services. I remember, in fact, sitting up in the balcony up there and just at times trying to, trying to take it in. But I was, as a, as a young man, of junior, senior in high school, and then my first couple of years of, of college at, at Broward College over there in Pines Boulevard, I just remember all the pressures that I was feeling, all the confusion. I was, I was here and I was, I was wanting to know God, but I was, my heart was full of doubt. I was full of confusion. I was, I was angry. I was depressed. I was, I was just adrift. And so I know firsthand what that feels like. But I believe that God will meet young men and women in the same way that he met Daniel and his friends. 
That just as God did it before, he can do it again. But before we get into that part, I want to take a few minutes to look specifically at some of these pressures, some of these challenges that are a parallel in our generation and our young men and women with what Daniel and his generation experienced. Let's read here 2 Chronicles 36, verse 18 through 19. We read that Nebuchadnezzar carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. Jerusalem was destroyed. All of the resources that these people had were taken away. I believe that there's a parallel there that this generation is facing. There is a pressure point in their finances. Did you know that the average uh, student has $37,000 of student loan debt when they graduate today? Did you know that the accumulation of student loan debt is now $1.3 trillion in this country? It's crazy. Consider this. In the last 25 years, median wages have increased by 1.6%, and yet the median student loan uh, uh, has increased by 164%. That's a drastic difference. 1.6% increase in median wages, but 164% of student loan debt. Many young people today, particularly those of college age, are stressed out about finances. They are thinking, man, I, like, I don't even know what to do. It, they have, have questions, should I even be going into debt? But if I don't go to college, how am I going to get a good job? And they think, man, like, they, and so it's not just a little bit of a concern that they have. For many students, it's almost a paralyzing fear of how am I going to be able to succeed in life? How am I going to be able to make it? Uh, it's serious. It, it causes people to prolong other life decisions, getting married, having children and such. So finances, this is a huge area of concern. A second area, though, is detachment. Detachment. As we saw, Daniel and this whole generation, they were ripped away from their homeland. They were away. They were in this place where they were somewhat disoriented. Again, I believe this is a parallel that we can see with our current generation. So many express a sense of disorientation, a sense of detachment from other people in their lives. Now, part of this... Of course, if the student is going away to college, well, this is their first time away from home. Maybe they're the only person that they even know. If none of the other friends that they have from high school are at this university, so there can be a sense of physical detachment. However, it certainly goes beyond that. It's interesting that we live in one of the most digitally connected times in history. We're more connected than we've ever been. I mean, through the smartphone, I mean, it's texting, it's, it's Instagram, Instagram stories, Facebook, Snapchat. I mean, just the list goes on and on and on. I mean, ways that we're connecting with one another digitally. And yet, multiple studies have shown that this generation feels more disconnected from other people than many other generations have felt. In fact, this sense of detachment also contributes to a delay in many things in life, the delay of being married, a delay in having children. In our culture, many of us just change jobs all the time. Why? Part of that is because we don't feel that deep of a connection. We're willing to just uproot and go wherever um, because we're not really that rooted, not really that connected. And many of us, particularly in this generation, have a lack of trust. There's a lack of trust of institutions. There's a lack of trust of government. There's a lack of trust in churches. You know what? We just ha carry this, this distrustful attitude around us, and I believe it's rooted in a sense of detachment. Thirdly, identity. As we read there, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians had an explicit purpose of they wanted to retrain an entire generation. They wanted to train them so where they were no longer Jewish, but they were in essence Babylonian. They wanted to strip them of their culture. They wanted to strip them of their language. They wanted to strip them of their religion and of their values. Similarly, in our day, I believe that 
Young adults are experiencing this. But just to take it one step deeper as we look at how this was being done in Daniel's day, we see that even their names were taken from them. So again, this speaks to identity. For example, Daniel, that name means God is my judge. And yet he was given the name of Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar means, O lady, wife of the god Bel, protector of the king. Azariah means Yahweh is a helper. He was renamed Abednego, which means servant of the shining one, Nebu. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. And yet he was renamed Shadrach, which means I am very fearful of God or perhaps command of Aku, the moon god. Mishael means who is what God is. But he was renamed Meshach, which means I am of little account, or who is like a coup. See, their names were taken from them. And they had these other names, these names representing these false Babylonian gods that were being put upon them in an attempt to redefine their very identity. In this generation, it looks a little bit different, but it's similar. Many young people are asking questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? What is my purpose in life? If I fail a test, does that mean that I'm a failure in life? These are questions that speak to identity. Did you know that over the last 15 years, rates of depression have doubled and rates of suicide have actually tripled among college-age students? Well, why is this? I believe a lot of this has to do with this, this disorientation, this loss of identity that many young people are experiencing. There's an inadequacy and a disorientation Fourthly and finally, on these points of comparison, is the issue of defilement. Let's look at Daniel 1, verse 5 through 8. It says, The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. And so this issue of defilement. Now, it's hard for us to know exactly what Daniel's concern was in regards to defilement. It could have been that he was concerned about violating some of the Old Testament food laws. It could have been that he was concerned or had knowledge that some of these foods from the king's table had been dedicated to idols and that he was concerned about compromise in that way. It could have even been that he was merely concerned about giving off an appearance of trusting just in, in the king, in Nebuchadnezzar, rather than in his God. We don't know the exact issue of what Daniel was concerned about based on the context here, but what we do know is that Daniel did not want to defile himself. You know, this issue of defilement is serious. In our generation here today, there are a number of things that can defile us and can defile this younger generation. But as an example, I want to highlight one specific area of defilement today, namely pornography. Did you know that something like 90% of young men and 75% of young women are engaging with pornography at least once a month? This is an epidemic. This is serious. And why is this serious? Well, it's serious because what starts as just a little bit of engagement with this very quickly builds into an addiction. It's amazingly addictive. And what this does is long term, see, people will dabble in this and they think, well, you know, hey, it's just, just kind of a little thing. It's not that big of a deal, but they get addicted to it. And then what happens is that over time, uh, they'll think, well, once I get married, then, you know, I'll just, I'll stop it at that point, thinking that they'll, they'll be able to satisfy these sexual desires in a different way. But that doesn't happen. Oftentimes, these addictions continue even into marriage. And studies have shown that pornography use correlates with a higher rate of divorce, a higher rate of infidelity. And this even transcends the, the marriage uh, context, but has implications even for one's faith. Dr. Samuel Perry writes this about pornography use. He says, any porn use is associated with declines in religious commitment and behavior, for example, prayer. 
and an increase in religious doubts. The correlation, the more porn you watch, the more doubts you have. And so as, as we become defiled with these things, and in particular with pornography, man, it affects our relationships with other people. It causes us to get even more isolated, as we talked about before, this issue of isolation. And, uh, but it also, it causes doubts to occur. It, it stirs up doubt. It, and, and defilement is like that in its many forms, is that when we are defiled, when we are living in a way that is dishonoring to the Lord, what that does is it, it causes a sense of angst, a sense of, of uh, discontinuity in our relationship with God, and then doubts begin to be fueled. Not because of, you know, questions of truth, but because there's a, a spiritual issue there that is at root with our doubts. And I believe that this is an increasing problem in our generation, in particular for the younger generation, though certainly not limited to that, but it's because of the world that we live in where pornography is just a couple of taps away on our smartphones. And so we've looked at four areas of comparison where the generation that Daniel was in felt pressure, but also where our current younger generation feels tremendous pressure. If we were to stop there, we'd probably just go home depressed. But thankfully, we can find hope and encouragement in God's word. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 1. We read in Daniel 1, it says, The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. In verse 17, we read, To these four young men God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And so what we see here, this is the first point for you this morning, is that God was present and in control. Even in the midst of this devastating situation where the people of God were uprooted from their homeland, they were being taken as slaves into Babylon, that God was present and in control. Friends, we need to know that today, even in the midst of the darkness of our culture, even in the midst of the great challenges that our younger generation is facing, and you know whether you're a young man or woman in the room today, or maybe you're a, a mom or a dad or a grandparent in the room today, and as, as this issue and the challenges that our younger generation are facing, as these things are just in our face, as they weigh on us, as they trouble us, as they even keep us up at night at times, we need to know, friends, that God is present and God is in control. God is present and God is in control. We can take heart that even in the midst of what we're going through, God is present and in control. Secondly, we see that Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. It's amazing that throughout history, God has used young men and women in significant ways. There are a number of examples that could be cited to this regard. But perhaps you've heard of Count Zinzendorf and the Moravians. Count Zinzendorf was, a, was just 15 years old when he was living in Europe, and uh, he, he, he dedicated himself to God during a, a time where many in his generation, they were just going through the motions of religion. But he said, no, I'm going to dedicate myself to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for God in my generation. And, and through him and a group of people called the Moravians, Thousands of missionaries were sent out all over the world. And there was a prayer meeting that they started that lasted 24 hours a day for about 100 years. God used this young man in a profound way. Another example of this is Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley, when he was a student at Oxford University in England, God met him in a powerful way and he dedicated himself to God and founded a student club, a student organization, we might say a campus ministry uh, called the Oxford Holy Club. And later his brother John Wesley became the leader of that. And these two brothers, they, they started a movement called the, the Methodists that they, they just, and by the way, why it was called the Methodists is they were very methodical. They believed that you should read your Bible and pray every day. They, they talked about getting together and things like small group Bible studies and, and accountability and a lot of the things that, uh, that churches like this church here and like ev other evangelical churches still practice today, a discipleship, small groups, prayer 
prayer. Uh, these are things that, that the Methodists really helped to propagate, and they would ride around on horseback all over England and later even in the United States just telling people about Jesus and leading people to, to follow Jesus and to, to make a commitment to follow Christ. Uh, this is what uh, began with a young man, Charles Wesley, and his brother, John Wesley. Other examples of this are, are St. Patrick. Now, in case you didn't know, uh, St. Patrick, he, he wasn't just a, a fictional character that kind of hung out with leprechauns and drunk a lot of beer. You know, I know that's what, what is typically celebrated in St. Patrick's Day, but uh, I don't know when that stuff came in, but it has nothing to do with the real historical St. Patrick. St. Patrick... And he, I mean, we call him St. Patrick today, but he was just a guy. He was, he was Patrick, okay? And, and Patrick, he was actually a slave in Ireland. And he was enslaved by the, the Celtic people, which were pagans. I mean, they worshipped all these kind of false gods and spirits and performed all kind of, of rituals that we would consider today to be witchcraft. And, and he was enslaved there. He was, was taken prisoner by a raiding party that came and uh, destroyed his village in England, and they took him prisoner to Ireland. And Patrick, as a young man there, as a slave, God met him. The Holy Spirit began stirring in his heart as a young man enslaved there in this foreign land, and, and he was converted. And later, a miraculous uh, series of events transpired, and he was able to escape uh, from Ireland and, and, you know, went away. And later on, though, God led him to go back to Ireland, back to the very people that had enslaved him and to preach the gospel. And this is where we see the Christian faith going into Ireland and a whole nation being transformed. So it's, it's totally, I encourage you, read up on this. It's amazing history. It has nothing to do with what we celebrate on St. Patrick's Day, but St. Patrick is an amazing uh, person in history. And God met him when he was just 19 years old. We, I could go on and on with examples throughout history, but we see a number of examples also through the scriptures. How about David, who we referenced earlier? As a young boy, God met him as he was hanging out with smelly sheep. He was the overlooked younger brother. Nobody even wanted him around. They said, hey, we're going to give you the dirty work. We're going to put you, you know, we're going to put you out. I mean, it would be like the equivalent today of like cleaning porta potties or something. It was just smelly. It was gross. Like who wants to do that? That's, that's kind of a dirty job. And yet God met him, and, and through the time that he had with the Lord uh, of worshiping, I mean, where did the Psalms come from? So many of them are written by David. Well, where did he learn to worship like that? He had all this free time on his hands. He was just watching out for wild animals and trying to keep the sheep to not kill themselves and walk off a cliff. Well, he had plenty of time to worship the Lord as a young man. Other examples are Josiah. Let's look at this quickly at 2 Chronicles 34. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Jesus' disciples is another great example. These were young men probably of college age. Timothy is another great example. We see all these examples throughout scripture of young people that God met and that God did something amazing with. And so if you're a young person in the room today, you're in high school, you're in college, you know, you're in your 20s, I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you today not to defile yourself. See, the world will lie to you. The world will tell you, hey, this is where the fun is really at. Go do this, go do that, listen to this, drink that, hang out here, do this, indulge in that. But you know what? All those things will ultimately leave you empty. And if you've experienced those things, you know what? It's not too late. Another thing that the devil will tell you, the world will tell you, hey, you've gone too far. Well, I'm here to tell you today that you can never go too far for God to grab a hold of your life. That when, if you're, even if you're running from God this morning, and maybe you just showed up this morning and you said, you know what, I don't even know about this church thing, but I drove past this church at Taft and 441, and I'm just feeling like I don't have any answers. Maybe you came here this morning in that kind of mindset, and you're thinking, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not religious. I don't know, you know if I'm going to fit here. I'm here to tell you this morning that God brought you here for a purpose. That even when we are running from God, you know what? God is right there if we would just turn to him. God is pursuing us even when we are running from him. Why is he doing that? Because he loves you. 
because he cares for you, because you are made in his image, and because he loves you so much that he was even willing to have his son's blood shed so that he could ultimately see you forgiven and restored to a relationship with him. But you need to know this morning that you have a choice to make, not only to serve Christ, not only to turn around, but I would urge you, don't just receive him as Savior. Receive him as Lord. Respond to him in a posture of submission. Why? Submission, that word, that just sounds like, whoa, like, are you, are you trying to get some kind of authoritarian thing? Like, no. Submission to Jesus is amazing because unlike other situations where you might hear the word submission in a more negative sense or a controlling sense or a, a harmful sense, submitting to Jesus is actually opening you up for blessing from God. When you submit to Jesus, all his purposes for you are good. And so when you submit to him, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's difficult, and he says, hey, I need you to stop doing that. I need you just to stop watching pornography. I need you to just stop hanging out with those, those friends that are just, you know, taking you down the wrong path. Look, it can be uncomfortable to make a decision not to defile yourself. But if you will make a decision not to defile yourself, man, that's where life is found. Jesus wants to give you life. But it starts with us even becoming aware of the lie that somehow life is found in something else, that somehow it's more satisfying, it's more life-giving somewhere else and on some other plan. I'm here to tell you today, it's not. It's not. In his presence is fullness of joy. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Come on, is that true? I believe that's true. I believe that the Lord is good. I don't believe that that's just some religious statement that's meaningless or false. I believe that it is true. And that if we will align our lives with that truth, we will experience the goodness of God in our lives. But when we just go through the motions and we just sit in here on a Sunday morning and we just coast through life living just how everybody else is living, we're not going to experience that. We're essentially living out of a false paradigm. We're essentially living a lie. 1 John 2.17 says, The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Man, my hope and my prayer for every one of us this morning is that we would experience the goodness of God and we would live out of that. Thirdly, we see here that God provided someone to help. God provided someone to help. Daniel 1, verse 8 through 10 says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. And so the first person that Daniel even shared about his desires not to defile himself with, the first person, this head official, said, look, I can't do that. Like, my life is on the line here. If I just allow you to, to eat what you want to eat in your attempt to keep a clean conscience and not, you know, defile yourself in, in your religion, like, look, I'm going to be in trouble. You know, my, my life is going to be on the line here. And so, no, I can't do that. But Daniel took a step further. He asked the guard after that and said, look, could I even just try a little experiment? Could I attempt to, just for 10 days, could I attempt to, to eat in this way? Now the guard, he wasn't all that supportive either, but he at least didn't report Daniel. He just said like, look, you know, whatever, you know. That's kind of the, the, the gist that we get from it there. But the point is this. God provided someone to help. God provided someone to help. With all the pressures that Daniel and his friends were facing, not only was God present in control, but God provided someone to help, even if it was just in a small way. And so, friends, my question for you this morning is, are you going to be an ally for this generation? Are you going to be someone, even like this guard, who was a help in, in a way to Daniel and his friends and said, you know what, I know there are all these things going on. I know it's crazy out there. I know there are all these pressures, all these temptations. But he said, you know what, I'm willing to help. Will we be a church where students can find help, where students can find guidance, where students can be encouraged, where students are welcomed? I believe that uh, there, are, there are obstacles there 
to that uh, for a number of reasons. But you know what? Uh, we, we may ask, is it really strategic? Is it really worth it? Well, I believe it is. Sure, students, they may not be big, contribut- big uh, excuse me, contributors to the church budget. That may be a debate. Uh, they may not stick around after they graduate. These all can be reasons why we might say, you know what, is it really worth it? Well, it is worth it if you want to change the world. Do you want to change the world, church? Do you want to make a difference in this generation? Well, if so, I would appeal, let's be people that can be allies for students. Fourthly and finally, we see that God brought his blessing. God brought his blessing. We read in Daniel 1, verse 17 and 20, it says, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, verse 20, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the enchanters in his whole kingdom. See, God brought his blessing. God met Daniel in this place, and we read that he made Daniel 10 times better. Come on, 10 times better. How amazing is that? Not just a little bit better, not just like, well, he was like 5% better, 10 times better. That's incredible. I believe, young men and women, that if you will set yourself apart, if you will seek the Lord, if you will resolve not to defile yourself, that God will bless you. God will shine his favor upon you, and he will bless you. But, you know, the blessing didn't stop at just Daniel and his friends. The blessing extended beyond that. As God blessed Daniel, the entire Jewish people were blessed. Why? Because Daniel was elevated. Daniel was promoted in this foreign culture. And so the other Jewish people, they were able to see, man, this is incredible. Like, how is this possible? Daniel is setting himself apart. He is he's not defiling himself. He's, you know, he's, he's praying, he's honoring the true God. And yet, even in this foreign land, he's being promoted. Well, man, what did that do for the Jewish people? That encouraged them. That encouraged them that, man, God has not forgotten us. Even in this foreign land, even in this hostile culture, man, God is still with us. You know, we, we even see that Nebuchadnezzar himself later came to know the true God, in part because of Daniel's life. But even beyond that, did you know that in the book of Daniel, we see the first references to the term son of man that later Jesus Christ himself would use. And this is the term that he used most commonly in reference to himself. So you're reading through the gospels, you'll see him refer to himself as the son of man this and the son of man that. Well, where did that term come from? It came from the book of Daniel. And so Daniel's life has made a profound impact, not only in his generation, but throughout all of history. And so as we close this morning, I want to encourage us. Yes, the culture is dark. Yes, there are many real obstacles. But I want to encourage us, even in the midst of the challenges that this generation is feeling, God is present and in control. If we will resolve not to defile ourselves, we will set ourselves apart If we will be allies for students, we'll be advocates for students, we'll be a a source of encouragement and strength, helping to reach students, I believe that God will bring his blessing. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, we come to you with humility, but we come to you with hope. Knowing, God, that you are a good, knowing that or that, that your goodness is not some religious cliche, but that it's true, that it's whole, that it's real. And because you're good, you pursue us. Because you're good, Lord, you are, are not giving up on this generation. And so, Lord, out of that place, we just ask for your help. We ask that you would move in this generation, Lord, that you would raise up some Daniels, I pray even in this room today, Lord, that, that some of the young men and women that are here, God, that you would touch their heart with your Holy Spirit and you would break them free of some of the lies that they've been breaking into, that they've been believing into, and that they would move into a place of response to you, of saying yes to Jesus and no to sin, of believing the gospel. Lord, and I pray that this church would be a place where students are supported or where students can grow in their faith. Oh, Lord God, that this church would play a strategic role 
in reaching the next generation in our country and around the world. Father, we ask for all your help in these things. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.